How can you tell whether a game design is good? The answer to that question might, of course, depend on who you ask and when you ask it. If you ask a game designer whether one of their creations is good or not, their answer might depend on whether it's been signed by a publisher. I've shown it to four publishers so far and they've given me this feedback, they want this changed, this little subsystem doesn't quite work. All right, needs more development. Or it's been signed, it's off to print. Yeah, so it'll be out by the end of the year. Great, on to the next one. Or a publisher might be looking at sales figures, whether a game has gone back for second printings, has been licensed, whether it's gotten great reviews. If it has, great, the game is good. Clearly we have records to prove it. If you're a gamer, it might depend on how often the game hits the table, whether people ask for it again, how big a part of your gaming community wants to play the game again and again. Although of course, liking a game is different from a game being good at least from my perspective. When I do videos like these, often I'm not trying to determine or talk about whether I'd like a game or not, because in many ways that feels irrelevant. It's not whether I like something that's going to determine whether you like something. Rather, what I'm looking at is a sort of reframing of the question, whether the game design is a success. And this is a magic trick of sorts where I'm holding up a hoop and then I'm jumping through it where I'm trying to determine the framework for what I think the game designer was trying to do and then whether the game does that. So I'm kind of setting my own standards for success because of course I'm interpreting what I think the designer was trying to do and then whether the game does that. Lots of games deliver an experience that is seemingly perfect for what the designer is trying to do and that's completely separate from whether or not you like the game. So it's interesting to think about games in those terms, trying to step back a bit and determine why a game doesn't work. If I don't like something, is it just me or is it the actual design? What do I think the designer was trying to do? And then carry on from there. I bring all that up because I'm looking at this very tiny game Super Cats, a game for three to six players by Antoine Bauza, Ludovic Malblanc, Nicolas Uri, Theo Rivera, and Quentin Lebra. Five designers for this tiny little game from French publisher Grrr Games that plays in five to 10 minutes. It's a super simple design. There's almost nothing to it. And many people, I think when they play the game will say, there's nothing here. Why are there five designers listed on the box for the creation of nothing? And yet the experience of Super Cats seems exactly like what the designers were trying to do. Again, at least based on my own interpretation. Let me show you. Here are the components of Super Cats. We have this pile of 12 cards to be used in the second half of the game. I'll put those aside. We've got this one card used only in a six player game. We have six teams of cats, with each team having five cards on it. Each player is going to get a team. They spread those cards out in front of them so that everyone can see who they have on their team. And your goal in the first half of the game is to transform all of your regular cats into super cats. Yes, they're all secretly superheroes. And you must transform them into super cats for the second half of the game. You have this set of six cards that's laid out in the center of the table. And this is going to show what you can do on a turn. That is, put out zero to five fingers and the effect of you doing that. If you're the player who puts out the highest number of fingers that is not matched by anyone else. The core of Super Cats comes from the game system used in Alex Randolph's Raj, AKA Holster Geyer. Raj is an auction game in which people bid cards simultaneously, identical bids are removed, and the highest unique bid is rewarded. So over the course of the game, you're playing cards out of your hand, you can track what other people play, and ideally make smarter bids as the game progresses because you know which cards are not available to various players. Super Cats works similarly, except you are bidding zero to five fingers. And ideally over the course of the game, you lose no fingers and you can continue to make all the possible bids. All the three to six players bid at the same time by counting off Super Cats. And whatever your bid is, you look around. If you have bid the same thing as someone else, you're out. If four is the highest unique bid, then I get the reward for that. And then we just do it again, Super Cats. Ideally, not hesitating when you bid, 
but just throwing that out there. The reward that you get for having the highest unique bid will vary depending on what that bid is. If you won with a bid of zero because everyone else was eliminated, you get to flip two of your cats over to the highest side. Hmm, a big incentive for bidding zero, but you have to hope that everyone else matches and is knocked out. If you win with a one, you flip over one of your cats, and in the next round, you bid with two hands. So, super cats! You put out two numbers, and ideally, one of them will survive and be highest. With two and three, you flip over one of your cats. With a four, you flip over one of yours and one of your neighbors, because four is likely to win, so share the joy. Get someone else flipped over as well to their super side. With a five, you flip over one of your cats, and in the subsequent round, you must bid a two. So that makes it unlikely for you to win multiple rounds consecutively, except, of course, other people might be eliminated, and no one else is likely to bid a two since they know you are bidding a two. So you might win anyway. You continue play until one player succeeds in getting their team completely flipped over to Super Cats, and then they are the champion as you head into round two. Gameplay in Super Cats is quick and intuitive because there's almost nothing to it. Super Cats. Super Cats. Super Cats. You can do that. Anyone can do that. It's a game for anyone. That's the goal. That's what it's designed to be. This quick introduction where you teach someone in 30 seconds, you just start throwing numbers around and then you're playing off what other people are doing. There's, n there's, there's almost nothing there and yet can be quite engaging depending upon who you're playing with. I have played five times with four different sessions with people. I had one with gamers. They're all just like, really? That's it? And I play with kids, I play with casual people, and they are much more into it because it's just like this little riff. You're sort of reenacting personal rivalries through the game table. That's all I'm trying to do is outthink you. That's all that matters. And as long as I outdo you or keep you from scoring because I know you're going to do five because you always do five and I'm just trying to stuff you, it works. And then you move on to the second half of the game once someone has actually created their team of super cats. In the second phase, whoever transformed their cats into a team of super cats will now face off against Robodog, a character comprised of 12 cards that is controlled, in a manner of speaking, by the other players in the game, who, in a fit of jealousy, could not transform their cats into super cats and therefore teamed up with Robodog to take out the super cats. This player's job is to remove all 12 cards of Robodog, and they are then victorious. All the other players are trying to transform the Super Cats back into regular cats, so they'll be just like all the other cats in the game, and this player will then lose. Gameplay in the second half of Super Cats is nearly identical to the first half with one minor difference. Perhaps you can spot it. Robodog. Yes, you chant something different before you throw your number sign. But otherwise, you're doing the same thing, throwing a number from 0 to 5. But now the effects of those numbers differ depending on who you are. If you're the player with the team of Super Cats, and you throw a number that's not matched by anyone else, then you remove that many cards from Robodog. So you can remove 1 to 5 cards based on what you throw. Of course, you're probably going to throw 5, right? But then... Other people can block you. If the players controlling Robodog throw a number that the Super Cat player throws, then the Super Cat player must flip one of as many cats from Super back to normal as the number of people who match them. So, if the Super Cat player throws a five and three other players throw a five, then three of their cats go back to normal. And if all of their cats are returned to normal, they lose the game. The Super Cat player can throw zero, which would normally do no damage to Robodog because you're not throwing any fingers out there, you're not sending any cats out to attack. But if the Super Cat player throws a zero and no one else matches them, then they flip all their cats from normal back to super powered ability, super powered status. And however many cats they flip is the number of damage done to Robodog. Cats come. You know, throw off their normal fur. I'm not sure exactly how that works. They tie on their cape and launch themselves immediately at Robodog, causing damage to him. So all the players who are controlling Robodog must account for the zero as well. You cannot consult on what numbers you're going to throw. You can't just agree you're going to throw five, you're going to throw four, you're going to do it. No. 
It just has to be spontaneous. You're watching what people throw and maybe, okay, you keep throwing fours and you keep throwing threes and I will not throw those, but there's not as many opponents as the number of things that the super cat player can throw. So naturally some of them will get through. In a six player game where there are five opponents against super cat, then the super cat player has one bonus silver cat card and once during play, instead of taking damage and flipping their cats over to regular side, to the regular face, the super cat player can have all silver cat absorb all the damage and then poof out of existence. That's it. So you got this one time balance. With three players, it's very easy, of course. You'd have only two opponents who are throwing numbers at you. So it'd be easy to dodge them. So in a three player game, both of the people opposing you get to use both hands. So again, still can't coordinate, but I'm at least gonna throw two different numbers. And if someone else does, it's sort of like four players fighting against you. So I've played Super Cats five times with three to six players. The three player game is a little less interesting because there is not much in the way of competition in the first half of the game. Uh, I played with my son, who is 10, who just wanted to throw fives all the time. So you could throw a five as well to block him and let the other player flip their cats. Or you can not throw a five and then he would flip something and then throw a two next time. So it's also just the personality of the players. But he loves the game and has played it multiple times. So with more people, you've got more randomness in terms of what's being thrown. And so you get little rhythms of trying to outguess who's gonna throw what, but it's sort of random as to what's gonna happen. It's just the magic of what does happen. And you're like, oh yeah, I got it. I got it. And there's moments where it is an auction game in a weird sense. Uh, there's a theory that of course, every game is an auction game in disguise, but Super Cat sort of is an auction where you are making a bid and if no one else matches your bid and it's the highest bid, you get a reward. And it's good to get rewards. It feels good when you do something and you get rewarded for it. And this game has one of the simplest premises possible. You're just throwing out a number of fingers and you're gonna get some reward. Anyone can do it. So there you go. It, it's, it's strange how simple this game is. And yet I think this is exactly what the designers had in mind. This weird little face-off between all the players where you're just trying to get in each other's heads and have some laughs as you're trying to do this stuff. Oh, oh, you became the hero. Okay, well, fine. We're going to take you down. That's all that matters now. I don't care about anything else. Just scorch the earth. If I can't win, then you can't win, which means I win. So it's very simple design, very straightforward. It does exactly what I think it's designed to do just create this weird party atmosphere in one of the simplest way possible, simplest ways possible with a deck of cards and your hand. And that's it. That's all you're bringing to the table. Just making super cats, taking people out. That's all it is.